to the second training offering for Building Safety Month 2013. This uh, program is being presented by the Liberty Chapter of Philadelphia. It is accredited for C continuing education credits, CEU. Uh, today we have the National Fire uh, Escape Association with Cisco Menendez that's going to be presenting. Um, so he has a very comprehensive uh, program. We've been trying to get him in to do this for uh, for quite a while. So we're we're proud that we're able to get Cisco in uh, with uh, with your group uh, to present to the city of Philadelphia. Okay. So with that, um, uh, please welcome Cisco. Okay. Uh, all right. So I know we got a mix of guys in the building department, and fire department. And if we have any maintenance uh, or any uh, other like uh, housing guys here, we're going to cover all all the codes. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, what codes are out there and how we interpreted them. We teach this very same class we've taught it from Seattle to San Diego, Chicago to Texas, from Maine to Florida. And basically, all we're going to do is just talk about what we see, what we've read, tell you about some of the power you have that you didn't even know you had, describe what low test means. <coughs> Describe what other evidence of strength really means. I'll show you pieces. This is Rusty. Rusty came off uh, as is from an elementary school. Okay? And we've replaced it with another fire escape, but it was in use for kids kindergarten to eighth grade to use every day to go to recess. From the second story to the, to the recess. And this is actually how we took it out of there, and then we replaced it. Now, this used to be four feet wide. We shrunk it down. And we have a nice, so it's the dog and pony show, but if we, you can't get out there and see horror, we, we bring horror onto you. And what happens is, and what we're going to be discussing today is what's in this book. And um, this picture actually happened in Boston, and uh, it won a Pulitzer Prize for the photograph. So if you want, one of the things you can do with this book is post it up on your wall and just use the poster of it, so in case somebody tells you they're not going to fix their fire escape, they're not going to do anything, I'm going to tell you who fire escapes hurt. Fire escapes basically <coughs> hurt the tenants. The woman died on this photograph. The niece who was visiting landed on her. Survivor was critically injured. The fireman with one hand saved himself on the ladder from the fourth floor. It was at that time that the Boston Code, which used to be must maintain fire escapes at all times, changed to, no, we have to look at it every five years and prove to us that it's good. Then once that was done, that's, that became a sleeping law again and everybody sort of ignored it. So we're going to talk about Fire escapes. So I've inspected fire escapes everywhere, including Philadelphia, so we can talk about what I've seen out there um, and what this course means and what we've done and, and has changed. So with you also in your book, you have this. <coughs> it's just a little insert, and what you have is two models in there. You have a model city, which is uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, and we have a model state, which is Portland, Oregon. So a lot of times I'm brought in only when somebody has either fallen to their death or close to their death. Um, so. Oregon, we've been working with for five years. Seattle, we've been working with for five years. Portland, Oregon caught a code change. So they addressed every issue, uh, including how to inspect fire escapes, how to repair fire escapes, how to load test fire escapes. Uh, so with that, we gave you some models. So if you were to go on here, and I'll, I'll now talk about the inside of this book, and then we're going to start the class, OK? What we're going to be talking about today is that everybody in here has departmental procedures and guidelines. So we'll send you this. And basically it says, if you're an inspector, you know, a structural engineer or a fire escape inspector or an architect, and you're going to inspect the building in your area, if you read these general guidelines, these are the general practices that you should hold. If you're going to repair a fire escape in, a fire, in, a, in your area, the vendor should be following the guidelines with a, with a permit of the inspector who basically prepared. So this is the watchful eye is by the, the uh, structural engineer or the architect. Even if you're going to paint it, all fire escapes now older than 78 are presumed to have lead. So you, there's an EPA requirement on how you scrape it and paint it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're also going to cover today, besides lead safe with the EPA, we're going to bring OSHA. You guys know that OSHA has a standard that I think you'll find shocking today. Another, another hand grenade to keep in your pocket in case you're getting somebody not being cooperative when you want fire escapes. Okay. This is a standard industry standard fire escape confidence test. If you go to seattle.org and you download, you go to their fire prevention, you've got all kinds of confidence tests for sprinklers, for alarms. They also, we've designed this for them. So if you go to seattle.org, you can download an industry standard confidence test 
that an instructional engineer must go through. So no longer you'll take his opinion for the best of my information, knowledge, and belief. You'll take, hey, did you read the checklist and did you check yes and no? So a lot of states have adopted our checklist. This, with today's technology, you don't have to go look at a fire escape. Whoever's going to inspect it for you has got to give you plenty of photographs. And he doesn't have to even print them out. He can email them to you to show you how bad the situation is. So correct reporting is important. And Oregon addressed that. Here's an industry standard documentation that the most states have. It's called a construction control document. It's a preliminary and a final affidavit. So your state has one of these. So that anything that's a commercial and over 35,000 cubic, they need construction control. Well, here's one that all we did was just put the fire, the fire escape code on the top of it and modify the rest of the document in no way. And so this document says we need to know who is the architect or engineer or the professional, you know, having a, the control of the, of the project. So I want to know what permit number is being used. So this is the guy watching the fire escape being done, not you. And then there's a final affidavit. And the final affidavit is basically saying that I'm going to give you the document you need, which is, what we're going to show here is this fire escape can be spot repaired and it's an automatic load test if it's spot repaired. They leave behind one rivet, one square bolt. You have confidence in it? So how do you get the confidence? What's the law already give you? It's already in the word, in the doc, in all your codes. Load test. The physical, and I have photographs and I have video here to show you of sandbags or water 100 pounds per square foot. So if you have a 4x4 four four platform, that's going to be uh, four, uh, 16 square feet times 100. That's 1,600 pounds of sand that we're going to put on there for half an hour to an hour, whatever the, uh, the engineer or the architect designs as a, as a criteria. Once it passes its uh, load test, are you good for five years? You feel sure it's not going to fall? Otherwise, well, the load test is the only thing you have. Is there another alternative besides low test? Because we're not pushing low test here today. We're going to tell you that that's what you have. If somebody spot repairs something, what do you throw at them? Low test. If they refurbish this in its entirety, all new, all new bolting, new connections, and all the worn metal has been replaced or reinforced, and all the connections into the building have been verified and duplicated. That's what it says. The authority having jurisdiction shall accept by low test or other evidence of strength. So if somebody wants to give you other evidence of strength, do you have to load test it? But if they take a halfway approach to it, and they spot repair it and spit paint on it, what are you going to order on them? But you need the power. You need to say where in the code it says such things. So we're going to go through all the code. So uh, repair criteria. Very difficult to repair a fire escape. You know what it is? Take the rust out and you re-bolt it. So that, that's the extent of repair criteria, because that's all you do. Don't weld it in there like this thing. You know, they welded all the rust in there. They basically threw silicone wherever they could. Got it? And by the way, can you, now with EPA saying you can't burn lead, can you weld on a, a fire escape that has lead? So can anybody go back and start welding these fire escapes anymore in your future? Why? What law are they breaking? EPA, a fine is how many thousands? 35,000 per, per event. We're going to talk about how fire escapes have been built and they haven't changed in 100 years. We're going to show you all kinds of fire escapes today. And from East Coast to West Coast, they're all the same. But they all were built between 1900 and 1930. Then all of a sudden, someone in 1930 said, hey, no more fire escapes. Every building from now on, two staircases inside, none of these fire escapes on the outside. And they said at that time, well, that's great, but what about all these existing buildings that have fire escapes on them? And they all said, well, Give it another 30 to 50 years, every one of those buildings is going to come down and fire safety is going to go away with them. And then somebody right after that invented bubble gum, duct tape, paper clips, slum lords. And so now you're faced with a situation where these fire escapes that were 25 to 50 years old, waiting for their re, you know, their rebolting, did anybody rebolt their rivets and rebolt their square head bolts? So now these fire escapes are 75 to 100 years old. And who are they dropping? Are they dropping building inspectors? Are they dropping firemen? Tenants? Do they ever drop landlords? We want you to pass an ordinance in the city that says from now on all rent checks must be collected through the fire escape. <laughs> all tenants should duct tape their, fire, their, their rent check on the outside of the window and then notify their management company and the landlord that there's already three checks on my window that you haven't picked up already. <laughs> so 
So since that ordinance is not going to get passed any time soon, fire escape must be complete and integrated. That means that all fire escapes can't just land on a roof and then you somehow find the ladder at the other corner. As you jump over AC units, you must be, a fire escape must have a complete catwalk system all the way to a ladder or to a staircase to the ground. Ladders that stop seven to eight feet off the ground. They must be complete to grade. So people say, oh, people are breaking in. Yeah, that's why you have drop ladders that come to the ground. That's why you have fold-out ladders that come to the ground. What people did was they took advantage of the law that says you can have the last run eight feet and then complete the process to the ground. People just left them at eight feet and did not complete. So every fire escape ladder that gets inspected that's eight to 10 feet off the ground needs now to be complete to the ground. And if, they, if it's a dangerous area, they have to make it a drop ladder, and we'll show you examples of drop ladders, or fold-out ladders. They cannot be incomplete to the ground. You can't make grandma jumps, you know, seven to 10 feet to the ground. So there's drawings, there's cantilevers, and there's tags. Right now, in the city of Portland, Oregon, every fire escape must have a tag. In the city of Seattle, every fire escape must have a tag. In some cities in, in New Jersey, we've taught the entire state of fire prevention. We've taught it to all their academies, Oregon, uh, Sayreville, we got the same six-hour class, and a lot of them are, are, are putting tags. Now, who does this benefit, these tags? The fireman in the middle of the night that uh, is wondering whether the fire escape is safe or not? If he sees a white, if he sees a red, it's closed. If he sees a yellow, it's under repair. But if he sees a white, he's going to go up and, and save whoever needs to be saved. As you do your yearly inspections or your five-year inspections, then right on the tag, which is seven to ten feet off the ground, permanently attached to the fire escape. We'll show you examples of it. You can read what the next inspection date. Any questions on when this thing needs to be inspected? So just like an elevator tag, they're starting to put tags on fire escapes. If you read that Oregon code that I give you as, a, as an insert, it states in there that they want a tag permanently mounted to all fire escapes so that there's no more question. So we're going to give you some suggestions. We're going to go through a few things. We're going to show you a few scary things. What I like to do is, if you guys don't mind, I'll send this one down this way. This we just took off last week from a building that was a residential. And this is a, to show you just what kind of rust is out there. And you put your fingers through and, so if you want to get an idea, if you can't, if you don't want to confront fire escapes, we're going to bring it and show it to you just what corrosion looks like. If you guys don't mind, slowly just as it moves around throughout the whole day, you can send this piece, this is corrosion. What city did you find This piece or the? Oh, it, every city. Uh, this was in uh, Winthrop, Massachusetts. This was in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay, so let's take a look. Right here, right? Live load test, guys, right? By the show of the picture on the side and the top of the pad, you know this is an old, old picture. But you know back in the 30s and 40s? See how many firemen are on there? If each fireman, if this fireman uh, on there, each weighs about 300 pounds now because of the gear, five guys, right? But that's five by five platform plus minus. Five times five is 25, times 100 is 2,500. They're only putting 1,500 on here, yet that they can hold 2,500. So are they worried? Were they worried back then when these things were built? Because they got 1,500 pounds of live load, and yet the thing will take 2,500. But today, ready? And I know we have a few we have a few firemen here, ready? And I'll say it to this side. Oh, there's a fireman too? Fireman? I'll say it to this side. And the old guys in the fire department, right, with the gray hair, tell the new guys, right, in case of fire, don't use the fire escape. <laughs> All right, so just in case you guys, in case you have a building, don't plan on using your fire escape because even the fire department knows not to use them. And why? Because you just got forgotten. It's the bastard child of egress. I'll take my chances. I'll buy a parachute. <laughs> So let's take a look at the uh, the codes. And again, I'm just going to interpret the code a little bit for you. If there's a huge code question, I'm going to set you. I'm going to set you guys upon each other. Not, I'm not here to interpret 100% of everything. I'll tell you what everybody in the, in the nation does, what their general activity is related to this, and then you guys can work with each other and work out some policy. But let's talk about all the only code that, that, that we're working with. The International Fire Code is very clear. 
Testing and certification any fire escape system found in a state of deterioration on table shall be repaired immediately. Is that standard for you guys? And uh, then it says, depending upon structural condition, a blow test may be conducted. Depending on structural condition, who determines what depending on structural condition is? Is it the structural engineer or is it you that needs to be conv convinced of, of the structural condition? So if, that, if you're the inspector and the building and the structural engineer, the architect, whoever, chooses not to, you know, tell you what you need to know, and you're not, you don't have confidence in what you're getting as a document, can you order a load test? Yeah. Who said so? Yeah. The International yeah. Fire Code. The NFPA says it's best. The authority having jurisdiction shall be permitted to approve any fire escape system stair that has been shown by a load test. So they don't even go to satisfactory condition first. They go, give me a low test. Then they say, or other uh, evidence to have adequate strength. So the NFPA says low test is the only way to go. These things are 75 plus years old. You give me other evidence of strength, then I will for forego the low test. But everything in your mind, day one, fire escape's coming down your path. What's, what's automatically for it? Until what, uh, what does the structural engineer have to do to you? give you overwhelming information that tells you <coughs> that you, he doesn't want to waste the money on the load test. Because does the load test buy any paint? Does load test buy any bolts? Does it put five to ten guys working for a whole day or two days or three days moving sandbags around? Yeah. And are they putting themselves at risk? Thank you. And the International Building Code, testing and certification, all exterior fire escape systems shall be examined, that means you want to report, and or tested, which means load tested, and or certified for structural adequacy and safety. Isn't that other evidence of strength? So three codes. So can a building official, a uh, fire official order a load test? Can a building official order a load test? Can a, uh, and if anything's related to the NFPA, can that be a trigger for a load test? Three codes. Let's see if we have any more codes out there. You guys got your materials and strength. That's you guys, right? And it says the fire official is authorized to require testing or other satisfactory evidence that an existing fire escape stair meets the requirements of this section. So is testing load testing? And is Satisfactory evidence. Are we going to now use a terminology today called certification and we're going to try to describe what should be certification and if everybody agrees what certification is, you're going to not have to do a load test. Otherwise, if you don't ever see a good certification, if you've never been convinced of certification, what are you always going to throw down every time you run across a fire escape? Load test. And then you got the maintenance says you got to keep it painted, right? And everybody's painted their fire escape, right? So you got two codes. You got the code that says you must keep it painted. So can you walk up to a rusty fire escape and just fail it right there? And then order one immediately. Now, can you just load test on the fire escape as is? Can I load test this exactly the way it is? I can. Must pass a confidence test. Why would I load test that and know something's going to break? You know what these things look like when they fall down full of people? So can I ever load test a fire escape that has not passed a confidence test? No. So if all of a sudden somebody's got a rotten piece of steel on the side of the building and goes, oh, you want a load test? I'm ordering a load test. No, no, you must repair it, then you can load test. No, no, I'm ordering a load test right away. What do you tell that guy? You're not authorizing it. Right, because it's just going to, you're going you're to rip it to the ground. It's just going to fall to the ground and, 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 uh, and you've got evidence of rust and all the connections. you got original hardware. you got huge holes as, as we pass. If I load test in one of these fire escapes, as the guy's putting the last 50 pound bag on there, what happens? He goes with it, right? So um, take a look at another guy that says, this is OSHA. Exit routes must be maintained during construction repairs and alterations. This is a fairly new find. See what it says. During new construction, employees must not occupy a workplace until the exit routes are required by the subpart are completed completed and ready for employee use for the portion of the workplace they occupy. So that's for new construction. So if I got a building and they haven't put up the fire escape yet on this new building and they haven't occupied the building yet, can they occupy that building before I put the fire escape up, this brand new fire escape? 
pretty simple, isn't it? Now read this one. During alterations and repairs, with you know, gutting a building, employees, employees must not occupy any workplace unless the exit routes required by this subpart are available and the existing fire protection are maintained or until alternate fire protection is furnished that provides an equivalent level of safety. Does that translate into all second means of egress must be certified or load tested before any work permits can be issued for an existing structure and somebody's gutting a building or doing something? So you fix the fire escape last or you fix the fire escape first based on OSHA? So you got this building that some guy just bought, he's ready to, he's coming down with all these perfect plans, he's gonna be turning it into condos and he's got the central stair and he's got this fire escape on the back and he's ready to start demo and he needs the permits next week and, with, and he's got this rotten fire escape on the back, what do you tell him? So let's say the fire escape is going to cost a hundred grand to fix. <clears throat> we need to get acceptable temporary emergency repairs or scaffolding egress staircase put in there. So are you stopping this thing from moving forward? You say, hey, why don't you put up a, get a scaffolding company and put up a ten-story stair tower, tie it back into the build, into the building. Will that meet your will that meet your satisfaction? Will that meet OSHA requirements so that the guys in there ripping out the building now can get in and out during an emergency? Have they met that two means of egress requirement? So now OSHA says, and again, we, we added this down here to this clarification. It's basically 1910.37 10, 19, and 36. It says what? During repairs and or alterations, employees, who are they really talking about now? The workers. The guys who are going to be ripping the, you know, stuff out of the roof, ripping things inside, electricians putting in, what must you maintain first before you issue a permit? Or provide you something that's an alternative that says is equivalent to level of safety, but we'll decide what's equivalent. So as they get on this building, they really have to meet with the building department and the fire department and come up with a plan that is either a scaffolding stair or can they do an emergency repair to the fire escape system to make it functional while they're fixing it immediately. It's your, you, you call. It's your call as to what the severity of the fire escape is going to be. But now OSHA plays a game here, right? So can uh, if somebody's really being hard on you and not really dealing with a second means of egress, can you drag OSHA in? And when OSHA comes to talk to you, what do they usually bring? Their checkbook or well, your checkbook? <laughs> right? So again, the power that is out there in codes. This is what we're trying to avoid. Flames coming out of the side of the building. Our car state was one of the scarier moments because when you pull up to a building and you see children and mothers hanging off the side of the fire escape, smoke <coughs> swirling around them. They said, that's scary, scary stuff. They got up there, they got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were just on the fire escapes. I had people hanging in their fire escapes at the rear of the building, and on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Well, about 50 people were displaced inside this building up on our fire fire station. There's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in, except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. I'm Bob Wilson. I'll have a seat at Bridgeport. He was eight. Bridgeport, Connecticut. 50 people. How many of you have trained your eight-year-old daughters to climb down ladders that don't come down? and jump 10 feet to the ground because the, uh, the uh, fire escape ladders are inoperable while the staircase won't come down. 50 people. So when these firemen showed up, was this a firefight or a fire rescue? Right. So those three, five, 10, 15 minutes getting 50 people down from not some of the fire escapes, the guy said all the fire escapes on this complex, which had you know fire escapes in all four corners, holding hostage 50 people who were all freaking out. And they were lucky because it only burned one, right? Right? Only burned one apartment. And then they were lucky too that the fire department let them all back into the building with all the fire escapes not working. Catch 22, right? Take a look at, do you guys remember the uh, station night fire? Yep. 2003? We got a call from Channel 7 and saying, hey, we want to do a story on fire escapes and how people can use their fire escapes in case of fire. And we just want to do a one minute piece. So I trained the, the, one of the investigative reporters. She's about four feet and a half nothing. She 
she's a pit bull, but she bites on something. And so we trained her on the how to spot bad fire escape situations. And I gave her about a 15 minute training, brought her down to the Boston area, to the, the, to the, the theater district. And after giving her a training on what's the obvious to look for, I, we said, you know, let's, let's go look at some fire escapes. She goes, show me some stuff. I said, no, just walk around anywhere you want and you tell me what passes, what fails. And what was supposed to be a one minute piece became this piece.
to close a permit now in Boston, what do you need? Certification, Certification on your fire escape. So if you're changing your toilet, or you're changing your electrical, or you're doing your roof, it doesn't matter. To close the permit, you need to have a current copy of your certification. So use an automatic trigger. Make it a checklist item on closing permits. Or you make it a checklist item to open a permit, but you give them the permit, but you say, to close this permit, make sure I have a current certificate. For your fire departments, you basically make it when they do the smoke detector inspections. You make it a checklist item. You make them ask for a copy of the certificate. <coughs> If it doesn't get doesn't come with that, it's an incomplete. They still sign off the smokes, still allow the people to do whatever they have to do, but they have now triggered it and gone back to enforcement to say there is no certificate here. Um, health inspectors also have inspections that they do, and they need to add this to their checklist. Not only verify that there's uh, alarms, there's this, there's that, no mold, just make a checklist item. The health inspector can ask for a copy of the certificate. Not ordering one, he's just asking for a copy of one. If one doesn't come, it's a trigger back to enforcement to say this one is incomplete. Got it? So that's what they did here. And again, the main purpose is somebody's going to get hurt. And it's never the landlord. Not always the building inspector, but it's always a tenant and a fireman that's going to end up on the ground. Got it? Now, in the past three months, how many people have written one fire escape violation? Everybody look around. Now, there's a reason. I went to and I taught a class in Washington, D.C. I had a room this big with nothing but fire prevention. I asked the same question. In one year, they wrote. And one of the main reasons, they didn't know the code. They didn't know how to enforce it. They didn't know what kind of power they had. and that's. And that's just nationwide. Everybody doesn't understand how you can enforce it. So let's, and a lot of them also are concerned, I don't want to put a little old lady out of the house. I don't want to put somebody in bankruptcy. I don't want, you know, because these things occur. So we tell them you need to have options for these people. So let's say somebody doesn't have $25,000 to fix that fire escape. Do they have $2,500 to make it functional until such time that permanent repairs can be ordered? Do they have 500 bucks so that they can order scaffolding on their house? and pay $500 a month for the next three to six months while you guys work out the financials with them so that they have temporary staircase that feeds windows so that they can put the fire escape off limits but basically provide them with an alternative. So now the answer is not just ignore it because you don't know how to deal with it, right? And if you got a slumlord or somebody that does, you know, wants to throw, wants to paint the fire escape themselves because you wrote a violation, what do you say? So yeah, go ahead and do it. I want a low test. And, and before it can be low tested, can, what's the guy need who fixed it himself? He needs an examination. By who? By a registered professional. Who then says to you, are we ready to low test? What's he say? Well, not. <laughs> the guy just painted over all the crap. And the guy's right back where what? Where he started. Okay? And then that guy that has a $10,000 problem, a $5,000 problem, or a $50,000 problem. Can you order temporary repairs or can you order scaffolding? Just to basically put the situation in, on hold for a minute. So it's never just you've got to fix it. Can, can we do alternatives to basically get them to a situation where people can start talking again? Let's take a, let's take a, let's take a look at some live load tests that didn't end, end so well. This is a building five-story building over next to another five-story building on a hill, so the five-story on this one gets the, the, five, the fifth story gets to feed the rooftop of the other five-story. And there's a deck on that building, there's no deck on this building, and the people on the fifth floor with a deck right across the way, what do you do in the middle of the night? You and your girlfriend, three, three or four o'clock in the morning, you've been drinking and just came from partying. It's a nice sunny summer day. I mean not sunny, but a nice warm sunny night. You go and hang on that deck on your neighbor's deck, Phone rings, the girl says, I'll get it, who's never, who doesn't really know the lay of the land, and does she fall because there's no railing there? Five stories to her death? Yes. This is a fire escape that used to be here. And the guy was selling it, the homeowner basically fixed his own roof with his son, 
and basically put the fire escape back. And what, do you have, what happens with most mechanics and most carpenters have extra bolts and extra screws? Never needed them because, so when, when they were selling, there was five people on this fire escape, they only fell 12 feet to the roof line, the roof line below. Had they fallen further, there'd be a lot of dead people. But they, basically, they heard, they, these people were the trustee, the, the seller, the buyer, the other agent, and the, one of the, uh, um, one other person, and they all fell in this mangled heap. There was three fire escapes just like it. The guy that took the photograph of was ready to fall, and so was the other one. But this thing now is a quiet buyer of, uh, of lawsuits. This is a case in Iowa that I'm an expert witness on. This is the screw we found in a field where they put the fire escape that fell to the ground. Three kids were up there watching fireworks, and the fire escape, this used to be up there, hit the roof, hit the ground with three kids in it, that's all their blood and stuff like that, because when the carpenters were fixing the, the siding and they took out the through bolt, instead of putting the through bolt back, they put a latch screw back in the through bolt bolt. This is the field that they threw it, which is about eight blocks away, you know, fire escape CSI. And so we actually found for the We actually found the piece with the, the screw still in it. They put it back, and, and they not only put it back with a through bolt, they put a leg on it, which was not needed. And then the leg just rested on top of the shingles of the roof. And the corner that was, didn't have, there was no leg before in that corner, so it was an unsupported corner. That too was just off the shingle. So a lot of times, you know, Mickey Mouse put it up the first time, Donald Duck finished it up. This is live load testing that happens every day. Now with a no smoking building, what happens, right? People have fire escapes that they basically watch parades on. So they're all, they're all watching parades on 75 year old grandmas. Right? And you've got the, remember the old days with no AC, everybody used to sleep on the fire escape? Firemen, a lot of times you've got people being evacuated through the fire escape. Because for some reason they can't go up the front way or whatever, that happens all the time. People are taking pictures with weddings. If you're a college town, guess what happens? Guess how you go upstairs? Let's find out who inspects fire escapes. All codes say registered professionals, and a lot of times it's the structural engineer. But any engineer can inspect the fire escape. That's what they say. They also say in some codes, architects can inspect, but otherwise they say registered professional and you must approve the architect if you want to have them. And by the way, the code says other satisfactory evidence is strength. So if you have a structural engineer on one hand that's been doing some buildings when you and he, he goes out of his way to avoid load testing, and then you got this architect that comes in who's got 30 years experience in the city and he keeps throwing his credentials in your face and you're not satisfied, you're not satisfied with other evidence of strength, what do you throw at that 30 year architect that's put up a lot of buildings in your city? Just throw a low test at him, why? Because has he given you other, other satisfactory evidence of strength? So the burden is to put on you, because what am I trying to avoid at all times? Because it's ugly and painful and heavy. They say city officials inspect the fire escapes all the time. They said the guy was just here last week and he didn't say anything about the fire escape. Which you know, fire escape. I mean, city officials do not inspect the fire escape. They identify violations. They enforce violations, but they've never okayed your fire escape. They want you to get an independent person, a registered professional, to inspect your fire escape and provide a report back to them that it's either been low tested or how you they, they're providing back to that official other evidence of strength. How many people here have received an other evidence of strength report in the past three, three months? Oh, all right, you guys don't write fire escapes. So that's why you don't get them. <laughs> How many have ever seen a load test in their career? How many have ever seen a, 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 a satisfactory document like a reverse calculated load test? Oh, yeah, a good half inch thick piece of paper on a fire escape. <laughs> now, I had a, a gentleman, I think Martin, mentioned uh, something about, uh, is it Martin? Yeah. You mentioned about some, there was a, an ordinance in the area that says uh, uh, buildings in the area that they didn't need to be, they need to be load tested every every two years or every five? No, it was just a, a, a building had a variance. That's so what it was a variance so that they can keep it, but they must, they have to load test it every so many, uh, every so many years? Yeah. You, you know what the address is that, or what's that specific to? I could, I'm sorry. He's asking what address is that? Uh, like 120 North Broad Street or something like that. Okay, so I, so I said, you know, that's interesting because of that usually happens when you have historical buildings where they have to keep the fire escape because of a historical nature. 
and they have to block these windows with brakes. You can still get the sun, but you can't ever physically get on them. The fire escape, a lot of times they remove a portion of the lower portion so that firemen can never get on them. And on all the platforms, the firemen are told, don't get on this thing because it's not structurally sound. But, so that's, that's, those things sometimes happen. You get variations of, of things that people make up that sometimes that, uh, uh, it needs to be looked at. There is fire escape inspectors. We inspect, I inspect all of Harvard University's fire escapes, and I'm not a structural engineer. I have a license out of Boston to inspect fire escapes. I also have a license out of California that's put out by fire, the, the, the Reg 4, the, the fire prevention, and it's a, I inspect the fire escape assemblies. So only two licenses in the entire country. And you have to cross paths. You have to come into a city and say, hey, can I use my license? And a lot of times, a building inspector who says, I'm not comfortable, or a fire marshal who's not comfortable says, can you get it just backed up by a short engineer or an engineer stamp on it? And the answer is, yeah, it's easy. It's easy for me to find a local guy to stamp my, my document. And so I sometimes know more than he does about what he's, but it's, in either case, there is fire escape inspectors out there. Let's take a look at the opinion versus low test. Now, here's what you're gonna be getting. And this is why I say this is an opinion. Whenever you get a, a document from a structural engineer, they put on it. And we're gonna show you a document that we have even on our certificate, our certificate <coughs> from Boston that the city says, to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, the fire escape is in conformity with the building code today. What about tomorrow? Well, pay me tomorrow, I'll tell you the same thing. But today, I can tell you that it's not fault. Don't ask me tomorrow. Should fall tomorrow, I wasn't here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Call me back tomorrow. So that's, a, that's called an opinion certification. And sometimes the wording gets in there, load testing. And you load tested your fire escape, it's to the best of our information, load, uh, uh, knowledge and belief the fire escape is certifiable. They squeeze the word in there, but they've never physically done a load test. It's, it's, they, they, they're implying that their certification was the load test. It's almost like a, a reverse calculated load test, which it can happen. There's a live load test of physical sandbags on this, or I can do a, a test on a fire escape and say it, it has no rust in any of its connections, and I've recalculated out, like redrawing it, and I'm bringing it back to you, this information that says, I've done a calculated load test that says that it, if it were to be load tested, it would pass because not only does it have the connections are all free of rust and internal rust, but I've done my calculations on my computer, it will hold 100 pounds per square foot. That's called a reverse calculated load test. And that usually spends, uh, to do a reverse calculated load test in Pittsburgh that they want to do, they want 3,500 bucks. Just to do a reverse, which is go out and measure. And these things can get kind of expensive, but is it a really a live load test or is it a, a reverse, is it just a document of, of calculations? Right? So the reverse calculated load test is very time consuming. So since you don't know what you're reading anyway when, when these engineers are sending to you, do they ever go through that extreme of the reverse calculated load test or do they tell their clients they're doing a reverse calculated load test? They just basically you know, do one of these opinion letters and so in lieu of load testing for the past 25 to 50 years, you guys have been getting opinions. So with that being the case, is this fire escape pass or fail? Right? And here I am, I got called by the secretary who basically says, hey, we got a, we got a letter from an engineer, and, you know, and what that engineer said. This is the letter from the engineer. A one pager. He says, fix a tread, fix a, a, a flat deck up bend, and paint it, and I'll certify it. And then he has his little disclaimer down here that says, the best of my information, don't believe. When we did it, we got all these photographs, and we condemned this fire escape that a, that a policeman who was checking in on a break in his foot went through. That's what tr triggered the fire. <coughs> well, on a lot of times they'll put their they'll put their um, their number. But, they don't accept that. Yeah. Well, that's not a with or without a seal. Is, is it an opinion or is it a or is it a low test or is it even an exam? Okay. So this is this is in um, Fort Lee, New Jersey, right? Take a look at Chicago. This is another letter I got. And when I spoke with the management company, this is about 600 residents at this, at this property. And there's about 10 of these fire escapes. And these fire escapes, instead of having the brackets below holding it, they have these brackets from above that come down and grab the nose. And so at the very nose, it has this nut that basically screws into a threaded rod that basically grabs the ends of these things. So you know, all these ends go backwards. 
And I, uh, I had to walk that so I could get them a bid on the job. And I said, you sure the fire has been, oh yeah, I got a letter. And they said, fix a couple of things, you know, spit paint at it and hide the rest of the silicone. That's what they were telling me to do. They said some other things here, but it didn't mean anything. Because then I came back and I said, uh, I've got photographs that show that the rods on the end are all rotted out and this thing's going to fall. Oh, no, no, just do what the engineer says. So was this engineer doing a proper investigation? Because he used, to the best of my information and honest belief, but if he was using that, that confidence test that we have that says, are, is 100% of all the connections free of internal rust? Have you verified every connection on the supports and on the railings? So the, is that an opinion or a yes, no uh, questionnaire that can get them in a, a lot of hot water and, and into court? So do you want opinions or do you want facts? Facts come from a confidence test. One didn't exist until five years ago when we made the first one out for Seattle when three people fell from the fourth floor smoking on a fire escape that was lagged screwed to the wood structure. So it's usually a, fa a fatality or a close fatality that brings things in. So this is the attention center for youth, 17 and younger. Looks good. So you get close and you look underneath, what happens? So if the incarceration doesn't kill you, getting out of the fire escape will. This is a, because we're involved in a lot of cases, we have metallurgists that work with us. Just so you know, it takes 25 years under certain conditions, but general conditions, to grow one quarter inch of rust. So if I got rust in the connection, it took me 25 years to grow that quarter inch. If I got half inch of rust, what's the average? 50. Now, sun, whatever side it's on, could accelerate or slow that down, but the average is, so now we got all this, what's that? How much rust is there now? When we go up a fire escape to do an inspection, what we're trying to show you guys, you guys are never gonna walk on fire escapes again, because you'll be able to look up a fire escape and identify if you see square head bolts, how old are they? 50 to 75 years old. If you see rivets, how old are those? They are 75 to 100 years old. Rivets came first, square bolts came second, and then you have, and then you have hex head bolts. <coughs> Got it? So if you look on the ground and you look up and you see square head bolts, when's the last time that thing was maintained? Not painted. Painted is a thing you must paint it at all times. When's the last time it was maintained as required by law? Because you put up a structure, when should I change these bolts out? 25 to 50 years. I have to swap out all the hardware. Keep the original metal, but swap out. So you're looking at a building that's already 50, 75 years old. So you're down on the ground, you look up, you see rivets and square head bolts. You have a violation? Can you load test it right away? Need an examination, right? If they got evidence of rust in the connections. So that's the important part that's to note here. So when we go up these fire escapes, we bring a little three pound hammer. <laughs> we hung all the treads for our safety. That is not a low test. That is just a safety test. How many of you carry ping pong hammers as you go up uh, these fire escapes? If you don't, this is why you shouldn't anymore. visually appears good, 
I have to x-ray it or load test it, right? But as soon as I blow a bolt through it, I keep my weld, which is in good condition, no evidence of internal rust, and I blow a bolt to it. Do I have to x-ray it or load test it anymore? Because the bolt became the primary, brand new, and I've just avoided it. I've given you other evidence of strength. So all your welded connections are a fire escape. Basically, as soon as we blow a hole through it and put a bolt on it, there is no load test. But if I come back and I've changed all the bolts, but all my welded connections, I mean my major weld connections, not my minors, you know, little you know, add-ons or, or scroll work. I'm talking about major structural. If it doesn't have a bolt through the welded connection, what are you going to order on me? A load test or an x-ray, right? For the welds. Everything else gets load tested, right? So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, as everybody can see on this piece, look at the original square head bolts there, all full of rust. Look at the rust inside, square head bolts there. But this other side, the guy changed one of them, but kept the rust there. And this new bolt, what did that rust do to the shaft? It ate it up. Got it? So, and this is what happens when a lot of people, you know, basically step on this thing. A lot of people don't realize that it's only a matter of time before this will naturally fall by itself. You don't even have to step on it anymore. You'll find these pieces in alleyways. They fall by themselves. Has everybody seen it? If anybody wants to see it again, we can pass it once more time through. And actually, let's talk about the... Uh, just make sure you know what the power you have. The International Fire Code says what? Upon, depending upon structural condition, a load test shall be conducted. Nine out of ten fire escapes that you're going to be looking at, load test is always what you're going to be forcing upon them. Do we want the load test though? Do you want to refurbish these things or load test them? Refurbish. Refurbish. Because the load test doesn't buy any paint. Spot repairing, if I had to spot repair a fire escape and load test it, it could be 15 grand, as an example. Refurbish the fire escape and give it a full paint job, silicone shut, every major connection is 12 grams, which is better for the client. Spending 10 and then five in load testing fees, or spending 12, get the whole thing refurbished. Now, five years later, I got the same exam on a fire escape that we just looked, we refurbished five years ago. Can my engineer give you other evidence of strength for another five years? If the fire escape has been maintained, then all the silicone shut connections are still good. So the average life of a refurbished fire escape is 15 to 25 years. Because in 25 years, what's wrong with the bolts again? They're old, and they should be swapped out in 25 to 50. So on a general condition, and who decides? The authority having jurisdiction. So the second one, the NFPA says, the authority having jurisdiction shall be uh, permitted to approve any existing fire escape that has been shown by load test. So in the NFPA, they want load test first, then you got other evidence of strength. Your building code, you guys pretty much use this code, 1028.6 or 1028.3? Does anybody uh, know what code you guys are using? Or you guys go right to the fire code, right? Okay, I was told because when you look at the code here, it says refer back to the fire code. So is that, are you building code? Yeah, the answer is yes. Both are going to be pushing it? We're always most stringent. So we bring it all three. So, the, so just so you know, the building code says you must examine it. So I want to report. I want to interface with somebody. And we're going to come up with a plan. And that plan is going to be spot repair and automatic what? And if you fully refurbish it, what do you do instead of a load test? What do you get? Certification. Who still signs it and seals it and gives you all the information you need? The engineer of record, right? So there's a whole new thing that happens there. Now, in case we have a financial situation, what are some of the options you have on a financial problem? You can scaffold it temporarily for how long? As long as you'll allow. And that way you get a better sense of what's going on. And scaffolding is rented by the month, put up by a professional company with insurance. And what are they going to put up? Mickey Mouse ladders or are they going to put up uh, code compliant stairs? How about that for your, for, your, for your buildings now? You're issuing building permits, right? 
I'm about to gut my building and I have an outside fire escape. So what's your first conversation with these building contractors, these owners, these developers? <coughs> what is OSHA demanding upon them? Not just for his guys, but when you show up at his site, what does OSHA demand that you have in case all hell breaks loose while you're at that site doing an inspection? Second means of egress, that is what? Under repair or has been certified and load tested? If it hasn't been certified or load tested, what do you, what do you got, what does he have to have temporarily? He has to have either scaffolding or he has to give you an equivalent safety plan. So there's a helicopter with the engines running all the time on top of these construction sites to evacuate everybody, just in case. Now, if we were trying to give a TCL, we couldn't do it. We just talk about what a TCO is. Occupy yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. different yeah. names. Yeah. So what's it? Temporary, temporary, temporary occupancy. Yeah. So what? If you don't have a secondary, you can so ask, you don't ask me. I well, just brought. Well, this is they're considering this. As your secondary, right? Use. But it's not up to code. Under right. Your stand under the standard or code. Well, let's get the code part of it correct. Okay. If this is built in the 30s, I cannot upgrade this. I can only maintain it indefinitely. So there's no forced upgrade from 36 to 42s, 24s to 36s. You maintain the existing. You're saying has it been properly low tested or certified? Well, everybody waits because this again this is the bastard child of egress. You do it at the beginning or at the end. Right. It's, like, it's like ugly relatives. When do, you, when do you introduce your ugly relatives? At the beginning of the wedding or at the end of the wedding? Or after the wedding, I should say, right? So this should be done first, not last. But yes, you're about to jump into the situation and somebody says, you're, you're about to close it all up and say, give me the certificate on your fire escape. They're like, what? And so now you need, you need to make arrangements because you're about to shut down a financial situation. you got a lot. Can, so they, you caught her, you blindsided them. So. What is your answer to them? Because the fire state clearly needs 50 grand worth of work that they didn't anticipate. So can I put up some temporary scaffolding in the meantime? Will that satisfy you and you'll still let, them let my people in? Great, I'll work with you. Can I, get, can I do, uh, can I do um, emergency repairs to this fire escape, make them functional, and a, a structural engineer is going to tell you that it is functional. And again, functional because it's already on the repair. Will that allow me? So we have the answer. So we don't we don't regulate that all these structures. So. We don't. We don't. If, it, if, it's if it's a required, if it's a required means of egress, that's why we're here. No, required is the key word. That's why I said most of them have secondary. Every building in the United States needs two, two means of egress. And if there's a there's a dangerous uh, <coughs> situation with the fire escape, well, there's two or three or four means. We don't, that's no clearing on You are correct when you've, you've met other requirements, but the only time a fire escape ever comes into play is when you got a kooky building with a central stair, and this is the only reason why two apartments on the left corner back can use it. So yes, because you've met the, you know, if you got 10 apartments and eight of them are satisfied with these, all these crazy stairways that you have internally, and then all of a sudden those two kooky ones, you shut them down, or you provide them with what? Alternative safety plan, right? Which has scaffolding with some stairs while you work on this thing. You just want to keep everybody in the same place. So if they, they don't have the money to fix it right away, you all you do is you know you tell the client you can put some temporary scaffolding. <coughs> and is this you and your client talking, or is this you and the client's representative, the, the design professional, working with you on this on this proper safety plan? Because once you're dealing with a fire escape and it needs repairs, are you dealing strictly with the owner or are you dealing with the owner's representative? The design professional. So the design professional is going to offer you one of two suggestions for that temporary situation. Emergency repairs that he's going to convince you will satisfy and the work is on the way. Or he says, hey, this is, a, this is a nightmare. We're going to put up some temporary scaffolding just to buy us 30 days so we can just, just take another look at this thing because we may find another way inside and instead of spending money on this, let's look at alternatives of maybe getting a staircase inside at this time and getting rid of this, this thing outside. Yeah, we, we have a facade program. So you run a facade budget for second stories or more. Uh, I don't know if they reference uh, fire safety. And that report. Again, and, and again, 
Right, well, anything attached to the facade, don't you guys have flagpoles and everything that must be coming to conformity? This is attached? Yeah, in New York, this is part of the facade, I mean, not New York, in Chicago, this is part of the facade inspection. In Jersey City, they have the green card inspection every five years. This is picked up at that time. Anything on the exterior must meet, must be compliant. So you guys may not have a code uh, that says every five years, but there's always other code. You have yearly inspections that will trigger these, these pickups. You have five-year uh, envelope inspections that will trigger up this thing. So the code is right here. Must examine, attach, or certify. The fact that it's been, this bachelor child has been living under the crawl space, guess what happens? You've, you've heard it there. You just chose to ignore it. There hasn't, there hasn't been, who has wrote a fire escape violation in the past year in here? Now, I, I did a nine story in Pittsburgh, a nine story in Pittsburgh just uh, these past couple of months, and it was, and it was um, the, Heinz, the Heinz Museum, just behind the Heinz, the Heinz Museum, they bought a building just behind to use it as storage, right across the alleyway, 30 feet across, and we basically refurbished a, a nine story fire escape. And we have to move a section of it because they're building a bridge from their building over to the fourth floor so they can bring stuff back and forth that way, right? I offer the same class. Right? So this is not just a, a Pennsylvania issue. This is, as the reports show, this is this is the bastard child of egress. Nobody cares about it. You know, and, and, and usually as soon as there's a, a dead woman and a baby on the ground by and you know with a crippled fireman, you know, you know what you guys are gonna get? You guys are going to get more attention than you deserve. All right, so we're going to take a short break in a minute. Let me just finish this code. The reason why you didn't write the violations is because you didn't know what code to cite. And you didn't know whether you had backup, whether the fire department was going to be up your butt, or if the building department was going to be, or NFPA, or now OSHA, right? Let's just throw OSHA into the mix. Does OSHA let you occupy any building? OSHA has no jurisdiction. I know, but can I'm just using that as an example. Will OSHA let you occupy a building and keep uh, people working in there that doesn't have a second means of egress? Yes. They will, they will refer it back to us. I'm talking. The owners will Right, but the, I'm just saying that the, what we showed you at the beginning, it says that OSHA says you must maintain it because it could be, be fines and violations. What I'm trying to point out is that many, many people that all say the same thing, it's all about the safety. But like anything else, we have to get you guys to, when you look at a building, you are paying the tail in regards to smokes. You are paying the tails about, about uh, alarms. You are paying the tails about exit signs. You are, you know, all these. But then when it comes to the second means of egress, what's everybody do? Right? Low test here. Low test here. Low test here that you use in case what? What do you, what do you why do you pull that trump card called low test? Why do you pull it out? What has happened for you to get angry and start using that dirty word called low test? Somebody's giving you a hard time. Somebody doesn't want to use other evidence of strength because do you want the low test? Is that what you really want? Is that what you want to do? Low test all these hundred year old fire escapes? I mean, you're not even talking about the brick that's tied into it. You low test it. The fire escape can hold. It just brings down the, the whole wall. Right? On some of these buildings. But if somebody's giving you a hard time, does not respect the fact that you're supposed to be given other evidence of strength, do all three codes ask for other evidence of strength in lieu of a load test? So nothing has changed. We're not forcing load testing. We're just saying you keep original hardware, you keep one original hardware still on that fire escape. Is it suspect? Because it's got rust in it or because of its age? Sometimes there's no rust in there. Sometimes you got a beautifully tight fire escape with a beautiful connection, nice and tight, and there is no rust there. But what's the only reason why I have to order a load test? Age, simply age. So if you have a choice, you can keep the age bolt that's load tested or let's x-ray it, or how much does it cost to take that bolt out and put a brand new bolt in and avoid load test? You want to spend dollars or pennies? So that's what we're here. So let's take a, let's take a, you want to make a five minute or ten minute break, right? Yeah. Yeah. We said seven and a half minutes, we said it's not the size guy. <laughs> 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 Anybody have any questions? Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>